Recording in progress. Hey, welcome everyone to today's hybrid planning committee meeting. I'm Councillor Alan Hunter, the chair of the planning committee. In addition to committee members, we also have officers joining us to assist with our discussions, together with public speakers for some of the planning applications being considered, who will be introduced at the appropriate time. For those viewing the live stream recording, committee members are identified with an asterisk next to their name. Can I remind members that the meeting is being recorded and live streamed and will be available for viewing after the meeting? Should the live streaming fail, the meeting will continue and a recording will be available through the Council's website following the conclusion of the meeting. Can I also remind members the translation facilities are available and to choose your language of choice if you are on Zoom. If you wish to speak, please use the raised hand function. You can also use the chat facility, but please note, I may not be able to monitor the chat facility during the meeting. For those of you in the Council Chamber, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand and turn your microphone on. Moving to the agenda, apologies for absence. Just one apology for absence from Councillor Gwenol Ellis. Thank you. Declaration of Interest, Code of Local Government Conduct. Members are reminded they must declare the existence and the nature of their declared personal interests. Councillor Stephen Perry. Yeah, I'd like Thanks. to declare an, an interest in 05061, which is the Glen of and Mokhtar Road, Mokhtar Colwyn Bay. Um, I've sat on the project committee in this and therefore it could be a predetermination issue. Okay, thank you, Councillor Stephen Price. Yeah, and I'll just bring in uh, Lisa Jones, who is our legal advisor. Thank you, Councillor Price. Um, just to confirm um, that you're declaring a prejudicial interest, so you won't be taking part in the discussion or voting today. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Urgent matters? No urgent matters, Chair. Oh, oh sorry, uh, there's just one more declaration. I'll just bring uh, Lisa back in. Yep, um, I understand that Councillor Trevor Stott may have a personal interest that he wants to declare. Chair. Councillor Stott, did you have a personal interest? You're on mute, Councillor Stott. Bear with me. Thank yep. you. Thank you. A uh, prejudicial interest in uh, the Penabrin application. It's uh, uh, zero. Uh, sorry. Uh, zero stroke uh, five zero three five five. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Trevor Stoughton. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, there was no urgent matters, but I'd just like to take this point to remind members that if they are not present, uh, either on Zoom or in the chamber because they arrived late at the start of a discussion over an application, they would not be able to vote on that application. Just wanted to clear that point up. Thank you. <laughs> Item four, the minutes to approve and sign as a correct record the minutes of the previous meeting, which were pages 6 to 11. Everyone's had a read through. Anyone like to uh, propose? Yes, happy to propose, Chair. Councillor Austin has proposed. Councillor Nigel Smith has seconded. Quick show of hands, please, members. Okay, thank you. Okay, item five is a deferred application from the previous committee meeting. Uh, 5A is code reference 0 slash 5 Travel 09. It's a variation of condition two of a planning approval 021384. It's continued use of land as a caravan site without compliance with condition one of planning permission granted under code reference 5 slash 2115 to allow all round 
all year round occupation of caravans for holiday purposes. And that was Morawal in Hearts Caravan Park, Marine Road, Penson, Abigeli. Um, that was on pages 12 to 24 of your packs. And I will now hand over to the planning officer, Mr. Kerry Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, members will recall that this application was first submitted to the planning committee in December. Um, and the committee resolved um, at that time it was minded to approve subject to further consultation with NRW in respect of granting a planning permission for a time limited period. And that in the event that NRW continues to maintain its objection to the proposal, that the matter be resubmitted back to the planning committee. We have received confirmation from NRW that it would object to the application, even if it were restricted to a time limited period. And therefore it is necessary to consider the planning application essentially with a fresh set of eyes. Um, NRW's further objection is outlined in the committee report. Um, and in response, we have received a representation. We received a representation on Monday from the applicants consulting engineers. Um, what it says is that in response to NRW's objection, the applicants engineering consultant responded as follows. Firstly, it considers that NRW's letter mistakenly refers to paragraph 4117 of the submitted flood consequences assessment report to argue that insufficient consideration has been given to a breach stroke overtopping scenario of the River Cluid defences. However, this section of the report refers to the extent stroke depth of flooding that is predicted to occur in 2000, 2117, not 2067. And we therefore consider that NRW have provided incorrect advice to the local planning authority in this regard. Secondly, it says that the 2017 um, tidal flood risk analysis main report um, does not consider any breach scenarios in 2067, nor does it consider a breach of the river Cluid defences, which it could be argued poses the greatest flood risk to Tawin and Kimnell Bay. Analysis of this breach of the Cluid defences was undertaken for residential proposals at Windjammers and Gwellyn Avenue, but only for 2,120, 2, which represents the design life of the developments. The results showed that the predicted flood outline for this was comparable to that for breach two, which was considered by the 2017 JBA report. Since both breaches are approximately the same distance from Hart Caravan Park, according to the engineer, it is not unreasonable to assume that their effect on the proposed variation of condition two will be similar. The results of the 2017 JBA report show that by 2092, the flooding which results from breach two does not extend as far as Hart's Caravan Park, although there is a, over, some overtopping of the adjacent coastal defences. However, by this date, the site is beginning to be affected by inundation caused by overtopping of the River Cluid, with a combined level of flooding predicted to be approximately 4.51 above meters above ordnance datum for the 200 year event, which equates to a flood depth of, of about 100 millimeters on the Morawell part of the site. In 2067, the defended flood outline is far smaller, with the majority of the inundation, including that from overtopping of Cluid defenses to the east of St. Asaf Avenue as shown. And I have included an extract from the map in the addendum if you'd like to refer to that. Whilst there is no breach scenario for this epoch, if the 2092 breach to outline were to be added to this event, the resulting inundation would not extend as far as Hart's Caravan Park. As explained in the FCA reports, the flooding that does occur to the site in 2067 is predicted to be less than 50 millimeters, although this is considered to be a slightly overestimated due to the lower tide levels predicted by the 2017 data set. The assumption in the FCA report that the site remains flood free until 2067 is, according to the consulting engineer, still valid. 
In response to the consulting engineer's response, NADW has now submitted a further representation, and we received this quite recently, so uh, please bear with me on this one. But what they say is, we have concerns with the application as submitted. We do not recommend your authority varies condition two for the following reasons. In response to Richard Brown's letter, in reference to two other sites mentioned, and in consideration to the proposed time-limited development to the year 2067, NIW have the following comments. Regarding site Windjammers and Gwellin Avenue mentioned in the letter, applications are considered on their merits on a case-by-case -case basis. Gwellin Avenue relates to a replacement dwelling where betterment was demonstrated, and the Windjammers application included appropriate mitigation measures such as raising the level supported with consideration of flood risk elsewhere as a result of raising the levels. The correspondence states NRW provided incorrect advice to the local planning authority by stating that insufficient information had been submitted with the flood consequences ass assessment. A breach stroke overtopping scenario of the River Clue defences has not been appropriately considered, and therefore we consider that insufficient information had been submitted. Within the letter, it refers to sections that refer to the extent and depth of flooding. To appropriately consider the extent and depth of flooding, a breach stroke overtopping scenario would need to be considered. And therefore, we remain of the view that insufficient information has been submitted to date to demonstrate that the risk and consequences of flooding have been properly assessed. In relation to the comments made regarding the assumption of predictive flood outlines for a breach in the Cluy defences, and the location of breach two, NRW would expect any evidence to support these comments to be submitted to your authority in support of the proposed developments. We have taken into account the letter from Richard Braun and considered the comments made in association with the FCA. Our advice is that the FCA fails to demonstrate that the risks and consequences of flooding can be managed to an acceptable level. Um, Chair, there is more in NRW's response, but it appears to reiterate comments they previously made, so I'm not going to re read those out. But our recommendation remains minded to refuse planning permission. Okay, thanks, Mr. Thomas. Okay, members, um, I'll hand this over to the floor. Uh, Councillor Andrew Wood on uh, Zoom. Thank you, Chair. I, I remember from the last meeting that um, Kerry can ref um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a caravan park of substantially over 100 caravans which already uh, exist and, and, and planning uh, it exists for those. So it's a historical site. And that there's, this is for the addition of six um, permanent uh, Pitches. Um, so, it, it, but I remember from the last meeting it, is that the uh, topological report showed that they were that the site was around about two hundred fifty to three hundred millimeters higher than the floodplain, and it never flooded in the um, tower floods. Um, the refer reference to the river Cluid um, overtopping and coming out is, of course, as you've seen on the plan, the river Cluid on the west side, the bank would then flood all Towin and Kimmel Bay and have minimal impact on Pensarn. So uh, just one question, is that, that that's an indicative um, plan for 2067 or later on? So I can't see why we're not supporting this. Well, I, I, I was happy with Nigel last time to, to look at this and, and see this as a, a tidying up issue of a caravan camp that was trying to uh, fall into line and offer the Section 106 agreement. So if we can, um, based around that, um, I'd like to propose that we, we um, endorse the planning application. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to um, clarify that the application is for a variation of condition. And that variation of condition application refers to the operating season rather than the number of caravans. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Mr. Thomas. Okay, um, Nigel. Uh, yeah, Nigel, Councillor Nigel Smith on Zoom. Thank you, Chair. 
um, well, I mean, I've never seen so many uh, AODs listed ever in a report. Um, but f for me, NRW talk about risk and the reality is what is the additional risk here? It, it's minuscule. Um, they talk about uh, inundation or overtopping from the river fluid on the presumption that the river fluid will never be um, further secured or, or protected. Uh, as, you, as you know, we've got um, a new sea defence scheme coming forward um, for the area, which is going to protect 4,700 properties, hundreds of businesses. And for NRW to consider that, that the same wouldn't happen for the river, should it be needed, I think is farcical. Um, what is the additional risk? I don't see it. Uh, Conway County, ourselves, have um, given numerous caravan parks uh, 12 monthly licenses because of COVID. Um, it just seems a little bit unfair to, for officers to be considering turning this down. Um, the other, the other thing is, I don't think NRW have realised or, or have taken into consideration, should I say, that these caravans are, are actually raised off the ground. You talk about developments of properties, uh, wind jammers, where well, those properties, the developer raised the, the floor levels of those properties um, to satisfy the flood risk. But these mobile homes are already raised off the ground. So I'm more than happy to support uh, Andrew in approving this application. I think the additional risk is minimal. And, um, you know, the proof of the matter here is it's not guessing what's going to happen. Let's have a look at what's what's actually happened in the past. And when Townwind didn't have a sea wall and Townwind was inundated with flood water, this site was dry. So for me, uh, we would be um, lacking, I think, as, as an authority not to approve this development or this application. Um, it just seems totally unfair that NRW, again, I'll stick in the um, stick in the knife in for development in the east of the county, and whilst I I understand that they have to follow the guidance that's in their TAN 15, it is only guidance and it's not a law. So um, I'm more than happy to support Andrew on this. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Nigel Smith. Uh, can't see any more hands up. Um, I just sort of reinforce what Councillor Nigel said. Uh, it's actually um, the application is for 37 additional caravans to be allowed to be open for 12 months of the year. There are already 84 on that site that already have that, which is on page 16 of the pack. So, yeah, it does seem a little bit strange that 84 can have it, but an additional 37 um, and RW are going against it. It'd also be worth noting that I've actually attended um, visits to the flood defences on that river. Uh, with NRW engineers who seem to think there isn't a problem, but as soon as there will be, then work will have to be carried out to uh, alleviate that problem. And interestingly enough, the current sea defence work um, from Clandillus down to Tawin, uh, from the consultants and our own um, flood defences officer, um, apparently we've no need for anything. So it does sort of fly in the face of what we've... Uh, We've been told, so yeah, I'd be happy to support the um, the proposals as well. Um, it's in an area that I'm a councillor for, and I know the area well. So, okay, thanks, members. Can't see any more hands up, so we will take this to the vote. Um, proposed by Councillor Andrew Wood, seconded by Councillor Nigel Smith, that we um, go against the officer's recommendation, and we are minded to uh, grant the application. Can I have a show of hands, please? That looks unanimous. Yeah. No against? No. Any abstentions? Yes. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Just, uh, Do me to do? yeah. Um, we will have to bring this back to the next meeting uh, because we didn't actually make a decision. We were waiting for reports back from NRW at the last meeting in December. So this will come back to us next month for reaffirmation that um, we want to go against the officer's recommendations. So thanks, members. And we will uh, move on to the next.
agenda item. But before we do, I'll ask Jane to take Councillor Trevor Stott into the waiting room as he is declared a prejudicial uh, interest. Okay, um, the next application is 0 slash 50355. Developments of a new LED lighting system to support the existing multi-use sports pitch, referred to as a mugger, at Escola Penn Berlin in Wentworth Avenue, Upper Colwyn Bay. Uh, we do have a speaker on this item, and it's Mr. Ralph Becker, who's registered to speak against the application. Uh, if you'd like to come forward, uh, you'll have three minutes. We'll let you know when you have 30 seconds left. Thanks, Mr. Becker. Microphone's on, so ready when you are. Okay. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Councillors. My name is Ralph Becker. I live in High Links, Wentworth Avenue. My house is exactly opposite the um, school. My, both my boys actually have been and going to that school. And um, I'm the closest house to the mugger where the proposed slides are going to go. I'm 33 meters away. That's from my front door to the mugger's fence. I have an upstairs and downstairs. I'm the only house with upstairs, so I've got more light exposure than anyone else. I've got five windows facing these directions. The lights will be mounted apparently on eight meter high poles. My house will have the, lightest, um, the highest exposure to these lights. And according to their light impact study, which was submitted on the 31st, my house will be hit I hasn't got an exact data point on here, but with approximately 1,000 candela. Now, I had to look it up. I didn't know what it is. Candela uh, represents the light of one candle. And try to make sense out of it, uh, there's a conversion rate to lumen, which is 12.57. So 1,000 candelas translates to 12,570 Lumen according to the light impact study. Now that represents about 12 of these light bulbs exactly outside my house, you know, not on the wall, not far away, close. So I think an, an old money that works out at about 900 watts of light, you know, old have light bulb. Now I consider that as an as unacceptably strong light so close to my house. There are six houses along Wentworth Avenue and 25 houses on Birkdale Avenue, all facing the playing field. And they all have windows. My, this is my bedroom window upstairs. And this is a typical house. They all have big windows facing in that direction. So I think, and it's hard to tell exactly, but I think they all will suffer a disturbance from that light. Also, it's in the middle of a residential area. So again, I think lights are unsuitable. The second point is the extra noise the MAGA will create. Um, obviously, there will be ball games being played there, and there will be shouting. The MAGA is quite small, so you will be a lot of banging of the ball against the metal expo uh, exposure. Yes, okay. Um, there's a fence, and it's a banging noise, and it will be young adults with more energy. And it's going on till 8 o'clock in the evening. And the extra problem also is the traffic. We already got traffic problems. And this will make it worse, especially on a Friday when most people will play games there. And uh, parking for local residents when you come back from home will make it more awkward as well. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, uh, the installation of such powerful lights outside my house and the noise and traffic it will create will interfere with the right to enjoy my house peacefully. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Becker. Okay, I will now hand over to the planning officer, which again is Mr. Kerry Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Environmental health uh, from this, it, what it says is that from the additional information submitted by the agent, it would see, appear that the scheme as designed will not cause an issue to neighboring properties. She then recommends that any permission granted be conditioned to ensure that the lighting scheme is set and maintained to obscure, to avoid obtrusive light and glare towards neighboring residential properties in line with the Pennebrin School floodlighting statement. And I'll show you a couple of slides from that in a bit. 
she goes on to say that should the lighting scheme be altered in any way in the future, a light assessment should be submitted for agreement by the local planning authority prior to any works. There is an objection, or not, sorry, there is a representation from the town council which says no objections subject to confirmation that the proposed lighting will be chosen and direct it shielded so as not to impact on neighboring residential properties. Um, we have received a further letter of objection raising questions in relation to the what time the mugger will be open, what increase in traffic will there be, and con raising concerns regarding noise and, tra and parking problems. Uh, they report that they currently have an issue with the later, with the latter. Officers consider that the information provided by the applicant's agent and measures that are proposed to minimise noise, mm -hmm. disturbance and light pollution would minimise adverse impact on neighbouring properties due to the proposed operating hours and proposed lux levels. Um, in respect of the operating hours, there is currently a restriction, a pl uh, planning condition which restricts the op operating hours when the MUGA operates. And on Mondays to Fridays, it's between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. On Saturdays, it's between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And on Sundays, it's between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. The applicants have supported, have submitted supporting information that they are not intending on using the floodlights beyond 7 p.m. on weekdays and would abide by the above times at weekends. In relation to the lighting, I don't know, Julia, could you could you go please to, I'll, I'll bring up the slide number, slide number four, please. Members, this slide, I don't, I'm not sure how clearly you can see it from the back of the screen, so I'll, I'll try and talk through. But essentially, what this, what this slide shows is the, is the light in Lux. So essentially, there are four contours. The innermost contour is 50 Lux. Then just outside it, you have a contour of 25 Lux. Just beyond that, you have a contour of 15 lux, and the outside contour is five lux. And if you could go to slide six, please, Julia. So what this shows is the lux levels at various properties around the site. I'm not sure how clearly you can see from the back. Can everybody see the, read the slide? But what you can see is that along Wentworth Avenue, Lux levels would be on the order of 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I think that I think there's 1.2, 1.1, decreasing to 0 0.5 and 0 0.4. Along Birkdale Avenue, they would be 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4, 0 0.2 towards the southern end. So generally, the Lux levels around the site on residential properties around the site would be below below one what the guidance from the institute of lighting professionals says is that in suburban areas vertical illuminate illuminant from light sources at neighboring dwellings should not exceed 10 lux pre curfew and should not exceed two lux post curfew. The curfew is the period which is defined by the local planning authority as being essentially night at the nighttime period during which uh, lower light levels would be appropriate. And as I stated earlier, it is not proposed to in increase. Uh, it, it is not proposed to use the m lights within the mugger beyond seven pm at night. So essentially. It is the pre-curfew guidance that you need to look at. And what the light assessment shows is that the lux levels at neighboring dwellings would be well below the recommended standard in the Institute of Lighting Professionals guidance. So on that basis, we are satisfied that planning permission can be granted. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, I'll open this up to the floor and I can see uh... On Zoom, Councillor Eva Lloyd. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what's the old adage? A picture's worth a thousand words. Those two pieces of data or pictures explain a lot about this case. So on the back of that data, 
I'd like to recommend the uh, the uh, Argomeshed, the uh, oh, translate that for me, the other way around. Recommendation. Recommendation, yeah. Okay, thank you, Councillor Eva Lloyd. Uh, Councillor Joe Nuttall. Yeah, I'd like to second um, Councillor Evo, please. Okay, thank you, Councillor Joe. Councillor Dave Jones? Yeah, um, I'd also, well, it's been seconded now. I was going to, I was based, just going to say that, that what's been said about the uh, two pieces of information that have been given um, about the five lux outside Consor on the graph it's way short of the properties um lights will be on they were well they won't be on past 7 p.m and that's not for all the, the evenings um it's a playground muggers are for play um playgrounds are for play and um playing children are noisy and that's accepted and um you know they need these lights on when it gets dark in the early evenings, especially in the winters, you know, to keep them safe. So, yeah, um, I'd go with the officer's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dave Jones. Um, Councillor Evo, are you including the uh, timings that were read out by Kerry in your proposal for the times for the lights to be off? Seems that's what's been agreed. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Joe, are you happy to second it with those timings? Okay, thank you. Okay, members. I, oh, sorry. In the chamber, we've got Councillor Stephen Price. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any scope for potentially putting a, uh, a tree screening line along that road to mitigate any potential concerns that the residents have. I bring Ms. Thomas in. I would generally support, in terms of tree planting, I would generally support tree planting as a good idea, but in terms of whether it would provide mitigation to, mitigation to, against light spillage, I think it's very doubtful that the trees would mature to a sufficient height to provide that degree of mitigation. So I don't think it's something that we would require as a planning condition. Councillor Dave Carr? Uh, just to clarify, we're talking about seven o'clock. Does that include the weekends? And if it does, I mean, we could be put where, where, for the sake of the residents, that perhaps it might be two o'clock at the weekends rather than seven o'clock, say seven o'clock Monday to Friday. And then if it's used at the weekends, maybe two o'clock, you know, that would, might be, be some good news to the residents at the weekend. Probably, I don't know when it's going to be used, maybe perhaps it was used on a Saturday or Sunday night. They might might want people who work so work. They might. Yeah, just, just go and tell him. Yes, the the yeah, the planning conditions that there is a separate planning permission for the mugger, so which, which effectively restricts the use of the mugger to ten a.m. to four p.m. on Saturdays, and ten a.m. to one p.m. on Sundays. They haven't applied to vary those hours, so effectively those hours are already fixed by the previous permission. Okay, happy that, Council Carl? Yeah, okay. Can't see, see any more hands up. So we've had a proposal to go with the officer's recommendation um, by Councillor Eva Lloyd and it's been seconded by Councillor Joe Nuttall. So I'll ask for a show of hands all in favour. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you very much. That's unanimous. Before we move on to the next uh, item, which is 0 slash 50261, uh, I think Councillor Stephen Price will just leave the chamber for the moment. Okay, right, members. The next one is code reference 050261. It's a demolition of an existing building and replacement with a new building at Glanir Avon Mokra. The existing property is used as a children's home and a proposal seeks to replace the building with a new building for continued use by social services as a children's home. Glanir Avon Mokra Road, uh, Colwyn Bay, and that's pages 25 to 33 of the PACs. And I will hand you over to the planning officer, which again is Mr. Kerry Thomas. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. In response to flood, conse the flood consequence assessment, NRW has provided a further response confirming that the proposals could be acceptable, subject to the developer being made aware of the potential flood risks and advised to install flood proofing measures as part of the development. No part of the development site is shown to be at flood risk. However, NRW notes that there remains an off-site flood risk regarding access to egress to the proposal along Chapel Street, although it says that no additional assessment on flood risk is required. In response to the Demolition Environmental Management Plan, the Senior Environmental Health Officer confirms that the proposed controls detailed within that document are sufficient. The consultant ecologist has submitted a revised biodiversity report, which details additional mitigation measures in the form of permanent roofs on the replacement building. That document is currently on, uh, subject to ongoing consultation with NRW and the council's ecologist. If additional mitigation measures are required, they could be secured by a planning condition. Um, and finally, we've had verbal confirmation that the community council do not object to the proposal. So the recommendation in the addendum is minded to grant conditional planning permission subject to no objections being received from the statutory consultation bodies prior to the committee meeting. As we've had no such objections, we can simply change that to read minded to grant conditional planning permission. There is ongoing consultation with NRW and the ecologist, but that's in respect of the mitigation measures rather than the principle of granting planning permission. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I'll bring in Councillor Austin Roberts, who's in the chamber. Uh, Mr. Kateris. Thank you, Chair. This is going to be a, a, a much needed resources for the social services in this county. So I'd like to propose that we go with the recommendation of the officers. Okay, to call everyone. Can you hear me now? One, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Anyway, I should translate what I said. Thank you, Austin. Appreciate what, that. What, what I said was um, this is an important facility for uh, the county's social services. And because of that, um, I think I, I would like to uh, propose that we go with recommendation. Okay, thank you, Austin, and thank you for um, reverting to uh, English for me. Uh, faulty headset, or faulty ears, one of the two. Uh, Councillor Dave Jones on Zoom. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, second uh, Councillor Austin that we recommend that we uh, propose that we go with a recommendation. Same use, same place, and a modern build. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Dave Jones. In oh, sorry, I think we were going to have a second in the chamber above. Uh, Councillor Dave Carr. I'd very much like to support the, the application. I think this this is a, a resource that we really need in the county. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, can't see any more hands up on Zoom. Uh, there was one, but I assume that's probably going to second as well so we've had a proposal from uh councillor austin uh, roberts and it's been seconded by councillor david jones that we go with the office recommendation uh, to allow this uh, application so can i have a show of hands please yeah okay thank you members again that is unanimous so thank you very much uh really uh pleased to see that one Okay, uh, we're just, Councillor Tristan is just going to bring in Councillor Stephen Price.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Price back in the chamber. So the last one today is um, application reference zero slash four travel eight five. It's the demolition of the exist existing building erection of one uh, building comprising of five self-contained apartments, car park and external private amenity, uh, 57 Marine Road. Um, and this is to uh, put this in here. Is my to discharge the section 106 agreements? I'll bring in the planning officer, which again is Mr. Kelly Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, as these applications, well, it's not an application, but it's more of a request, really, don't often come to the planning committee. I'll just clarify the basis on which um, section 106 agreements can be reviewed. So the Planning Act provides two alternative mechanisms where uh, Section 106 agreement can either be modified or discharged. If the agreement is more than five years old, then any party which is bound by that agreement can make an application to the planning authority to have the application uh, modified or discharged. And if that application is refused, then they would then have the right to appeal. If the agreement is less than five years old, the agreement can only be modified by agreement, essentially, of all parties which are bound by that agreement. So it's in this case, it will be between the owner and the planning authority. And there is no, there is no statutory recourse to appeal against a decision. So effectively, the, discre the discretion ultimately lies with the local planning authority. However, it is still open for an applicant to submit a new planning application. And if that application is refused in the, or not determined in the absence of a Section 106 agreement, then the applicant would then have the right to appeal um, against that decision. Um, Section 106 agreements don't automatically roll forward to new permission. So essentially, the authority would be in a position where it would have to renegotiate re or negotiate a new Section 106 agreement. So whilst it is ultimately at the discretion of the authority as to whether it chooses to vary or to discharge this agreement, um, there would be recourse available to any future applicants if a new planning application came in. In terms of the... Um, evidence. I, I fully understand that members may not be happy about reviewing a Section 106 agreement, which is less than a year old. And I fully get that point. And we have made it very clear to the agent that we expect such a, such a request to be submitted by robust evidence. And the agent has agreed to provide tender documents they are appended to the back of the committee report, uh, but they're not cycled. They're PDF, they're PDF documents, so I wasn't able to include the cycles. But effectively, there are two tender documents. The first is on page 43 to 47 of the committee report pack. We have been asked to redact the names of the contractors, and that's simply in order to ensure um, that the discussions don't prejudice the rather sensitive nature of negotiations. Um, but the figures themselves, uh, the agent has agreed that, that the figures themselves can be in the public domain. So the first of the documents, which appears on pages 43 to 40, 47, that was made on the basis of total development costs totaling £1.464 million plus VAT. The second tender document is more recent, and that's on pages 48 to 51 of the report pack. Um, and that's dated the 13th of January 2023. And that actually has uh, quite a significantly higher figure. Um, Total anticipated sum £1.71 million plus VAT. In response to those documents, um, the planning obligations officer has calculated new viability assessments. 
one showing the most pessimistic scenario. Essentially, it's the high value. Sorry, it's the it's the low value, high cost scenario. And I'll just make sure I get these in the right order. So essentially, what that one shows in is on low value, high cost is on pages 60 to 67. And that shows a de deficit of 1.095 million. The other scenario, the other scenario is the high value, low cost scenario. So this is the most optimistic scenario. And that shows a deficit of 571,000 pound. And that appears on pages on pages 56 to 59 of the report pack. Now I'm not a, I'm not a quantitative surveyor, I'm not a valuer, so I'm not in a position to um, really make a case on the basis of those figures. But Richard Clark from the policy section is here, and uh, I'm sure would be happy to address any questions raised by members. Hey, thanks, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I think it was uh, Councillor Eve or Lloyd had his hand up first, and now Councillor Smith, and then Councillor John. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question for Richard. Yeah, um, viability is always going to be a problem, especially with inflation pressures. Is this situation typical now of what's happening between buying, demolishing and an old site and basically creating something new? Is there anything we can build into 106s for this kind of contingency for the for inflation? There are there are probably a couple of points that are, are specific to, to the Sorry, can you turn your video off? Really, really. Um, with one of those being that. Uh, right, can you can you hear me a bit better now? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear that's, me? That's, thanks, Richard. Yeah. Can you hear me. It's always I I, I always uh, I'm always be look better without the video on anyway. Right. Um, so this this particular application when it came in. The, the applicant at the time uh, made the point that there were, um, it, it wasn't a viable scheme, but we didn't have the evidence, they, they didn't provide the evidence at the time to support that case. So, so it's, 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 not, it's not necessarily what's happened between the original application and now, it's although the the inflation increasing cost of materials has has definitely compounded the problem with this because you, you've seen the the increase in costs between the, um, the 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 tender that was that was provided last year and the one from the start of this year that that's gone up significantly. So, in, in terms of going forwards with with viability, smaller sites are generally more problematic especially where there's demolition so uh, there's there's no there's no easy answer to that and it's something that 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 sometimes we sometimes we're able to to, to to get to seek obligations from other times they're not viable so uh does that, does that answer your question at all yeah so what you're saying is We'll always have this problem on smaller sites because the economies of scale. With y yes, with with it 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 varies hugely across the, the the county as well with with market values. But yes, the smaller sites can you know can, can be particularly problematic. Um, but yeah, the inflation and the changes we've seen over the last twelve months have have also made things made things more more difficult. Hopefully, as 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 those things are, are are settling down with um then going forwards we'll we'll have to we'll have to see how, what the picture's like when we've got the new ldp in place as well and hopefully it'll be a bit more stable okay thanks richard the, uh, is there anything in the ldp we can change um to help well, with we're, I, I mean, we're 
obviously we, we're, we're still going through the LDP review process at, at, at the moment. So um, we, we've got to be a little bit careful about not wanting to use the the, the last 12 months of uncertainty as, as, a, as a basis for for our policies over the next the next 10 years but but the the viability assessment for that's on ongoing and and we'll we'll be looking at at what happens between now and you know in the public examination on the new ldp you know we'll be looking at things very closely but obviously that that's for the future and we've um you know we'll, for now we've got the current policies and the adopted ldp yeah thank you very much Richard. Hey, thanks, Richard. Thanks, thanks for your questions, Councillor. You are uh, Councillor Joe Nuttall. So, as the local ward member, um, I'm at a, at a loss as to why this is minded to approve. The 106 agreement is a cost that the developers agreed to and have, have to deal with. There are always increases in the price of materials between the time of application and the time of build. If this agreement is, dischar is, is discharged, it will set a precedent. Now, if you look down the road at Oddstones, there was no 106 on that either. Um, so maybe that did set a precedent and that's where these are coming from. Um, of course, developers want to make as much profit as they can. If a higher margin was achieved, would they then offer a higher figure? If this project isn't financially viable, bring back one that is. If they have overpaid for the site and design, this isn't the council's problem. Conway County cannot afford to throw away £52,000. This money will be used on local projects in Rose. It's no secret that Conway Council are struggling. We need to consider that council taxpayers that are facing an unprecedented and unacceptable rise of a possible 12.45%. We have a homeless crisis and it's morally wrong to discharge this legal agreement. How can we as a committee um, vote for a discharge? when the 106 monies are fed directly into the local community. Um, I'd like to propose that we go against the officer's recommendations, please. Okay, thanks, Councillor Joe Nuttall. Um, Councillor Mandy Hawkins. Um, I'd just like to agree with all what um, Joe said there. You know, these Section 106 agreements, you know, can't be backtracked and I, I agree with what she's said also in, in the fact that if they were making more money, they wouldn't come to us, you know, giving us more money. So, no, I'd like to second um, what Councillor Noel, um, Nuttall has said. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Andrew Wood, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, well spoken, Joe. Yeah. If it's a commercial decision, um, it, it, it's wrong to take Section 106 away from, as you aptly put it, to the communities where the money's got to go. So, yeah, I was going to second it, but obviously Mandy's done that first. So uh, thanks for that, Joe. Yeah, thank you. OK, before I bring the next speaker in, can I bring uh, um, our officer, Mr Kelly Thomas, back in, please? I totally understand where the committee are coming from, and, of course... W that there, there is a there is a negotiation process in place before these applications come to committee in the first place. So we do strive as hard as we can to ensure the maximum benefits, and it would certainly be a great loss to authority to the authority if those benefits, um, if essentially potential Section One Hundred Six revenues, were not to materialise. We are dealing in this situation with a site which is currently vacant, and I actually visited the site before coming here this morning to check whether any development works have been carried out. And apart from the demolition works, there have been no development works carried out on the site. So clearly there is a, I, there is a, a reason why development, why the development has not yet commenced. And the reason provided by the agent is that the, is, is, is that effectively there are viability concerns, some of which extend beyond the scope of the 106 agreement, but obviously we're not, we're not party to those discussions. But in terms of the 106 agreement, essentially we've got no reason to disprove or disbelieve the 
applicants or the developer's assertion that the Section 106 agreement is making the development unviable. Now, I do entirely get where members are getting from, but we do have to get ask ourselves the question, what would be the consequences of not agreeing to discharge the Section 106 agreement? And there are several possible consequences. One consequence is that the site could remain vacant for possibly years. It could possibly remain vacant until the applicant until the applicant has the right to propose a uh, to, to to submit a statutory application to uh, essentially discharge the Section 106 agreement, and they would then have the right to appeal. Alternatively, it is possible that the site could be sold to another developer. One of the, those of you who have been on the planning committee uh, since before May will remember that this was quite a contentious application when it first came to committee, because this is the site of the uh, one of the old Art Deco houses in uh, Rosancy. It had a very distinctive stylized appearance. It was one where there was a, a pressure group had formed to retain it. And whilst Cadu had decided that the application, that, that the building rather, didn't merit statutory listing, there was nevertheless a recognition that the building formed a, a, a distinctive feature in the streetscape. As part of the application process, the planning authority negotiated design enhancements to the building. And what was initially quite, uh, shall we say, an inappropriate design was improved upon and the design that was finally approved would merit a suitable replacement for this sensitive site. So it is important to bear in mind that the context on which this application was approved in the first place, if the applicant or, a, or future owner was unable to implement the planning permission as approved, they would come in with an alternative scheme and then we would we would then be in the process of starting again, negotiating design enhancements with no guarantee that at that time, an applicant would be in a position to offer section 106 contributions because effectively the constraints that apply to the site now would similarly apply in, in, in relation to, 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 to future developments. So I'm not sure whether it would be in the authority's interest not to not to not to discharge the section 106 agreement i do appreciate that there are concerns that whilst it would not necessarily create a precedent it would possibly encourage other developers to come forward and and try and renegotiate section 106 agreements but that is something that can occur anyway um, it can occur, any applicant where a Section 106 agreement is more than five years old, they have the statutory right to make an application to discharge that agreement. And although I would be very reluctant to discharge this agreement, I cannot see what realistic alternative we have in, in front of us that, 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 that would both safeguard the future of the site and uh, bring in bring in section 106 revenues. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, Councillor David Jones, and then Councillor Nigel Smith. Hi. Yeah, just listen to to what's been said, and um, I, I'm still in mind of um, agreeing totally with what councillor joe has, has basically just said um this section 106 money is so important to us especially now um especially now in the financial con uh, condition we find ourselves in um and i just feel it'll open the floodgates for um section 106 money to be messed about with um so i i, I I would, uh, I would second. It's already been second, uh, second what Joe has said, but I, I support what Joe has said. Sorry. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Dave Jones. Councillor Nigel Smith. Thank you, Chair. And uh, interesting 
what uh, Councillor David was saying about opening up the floodgates, because I think they opened up many years ago, David. There's been a, been a number of developments in Conway and ones I can remember, particularly in Rose-on-Sea, where the Section 106 money was clawed back uh, by the developer at the cost of our residents. Um, you have to put this into perspective. This is £52,000. It's £10,500 per apartment. That's less than the cost of putting one of your luxury bathrooms in this luxury department apartment development and probably a third of the cost of putting a kitchen in. So it's small fry. Um, Kerry talks about, you know, if we if we don't discharge this, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences for us, if we discharge it, is that we're not putting that money towards uh, affordable housing, which is greatly needed in our county. But the developer, yes. He could put forward new plans, but that would cost him. If they're, if they're of a less luxurious design, then he won't get as much for his development. Um, so I, I think really, I agree with Joe. We need to stick with our guns here and, uh, and say, no, we're, we're going to refuse this application. And uh, £52,000 in the scheme of things for this development is small fry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nigel Smith. Do you want to come back in, Kerry? Or... Nope. Councillor Stephen Price in the chamber, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I think the optics of, of this um, in regards to the local residents, uh, I think Joe hinted very strongly at what's going on here. Um, if I was to invest in a pension scheme and the value of that pension scheme dropped, I would not expect to be um, compensated. If I invested in shares, and the value of those shares dropped, I would not expect to be compensated. If I bought a lottery ticket and I didn't win, I would not expect to be compensated. So I can't understand why we should be compensating a private, in, private development company um, to wiggle out of a, a negotiation or a contract that they fully committed to in the first place. And I'm also mindful of the fact that no previous evidence was given in relation to the costs uh, in that, although they may have been provided later. So to, to, the ability to scrutinize those costs, those original costs, was taken away from us um, in the original application. So thank you. So I, I would fully support um, Joe, Joe's proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Andrew Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, on the same uh, guise as what uh, Councillor Smith was talking about and Stephen, you're talking about the, the, the figures that the applicant has mentioned. You're talking about the section 106 representing 2.6 of the build. That's all it's going to represent. 2.6 of the build costs. And that money is better, uh, can be better used for us. I'm sure that this, this will be a commercial. If it's not a commercial thing, they'll have to then resell it or all, redevelop it into a different idea. But no. I'm sticking on with uh, what Councillor Joe said and many other members. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Wood. Uh, Councillor Evo Lloyd, is your hand up again or? It is, yes, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, uh, Councillor Evo Lloyd, then Councillor Carden Chamber. Yeah, just a question to Kerry and to Richard again. Um, on viability, what kind of weighting has that got if it gets called in? Uh, not called in, sorry, if it goes down to appeal? Um, my fear it could cost that amount of money we're talking about in in fighting it uh, down down in uh, in Cardiff. So, what kind of weighting has it got viability, uh, Richard or Kerry? As uh, as as, as, uh, I can't remember, as as Kerry mentioned before, we there's no right of appeal for the applicant at this stage because it's within five years of the section 106 agreement being signed so 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 we don't have to consider it in terms of an appeal decision but we do have to as we do have to bear in mind viability in general as part of of planning decisions and if it did come back with either either essentially the the same scheme um or or a, a different scheme on the site then 
we would have to consider the the, the viability situation uh, at that stage, and and that they'd potentially have a um, you know they'd, they'd have the chance to appeal if we didn't agree with with their viability argument. Now, affordable housing does have have quite a lot of a lot of weight in terms of of this, but um, this is they they have provided fairly fairly clear evidence in terms of the costings to to support this and it's it i find it you know quite quite difficult to 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 support discharging a, a 616 because i you know i i would try and try and seek obligations from from developers um and because to to make sure that we we we, we get the obligations in line with with our policies but i have spoken to the um the architect in in, in this case who's been trying to trying to make the um the, the development work really and has seen the costs going up and up and up and i think it's it's, it's worth members bear in mind that there's that there's there's quite a realistic chance that that nothing might happen on this site. So it might not be a case of either we we uh, don't discharge the section 106 and we get 52,000 pounds, or we do discharge the 106. It might be a case of we, we don't discharge the section 106 and nothing happens, so we don't get 52,000 pounds that way, or we do discharge the 106 and the development happens and we don't get the money either so it's there's there's a from from the discussions and the and the evidence that's coming there's there could be a good chance that we we're not going to get the money either way but um that's uh, but i i understand where where members are are coming from yeah let's clean it up thank you okay thank you richard uh in the chamber councillor david carr Having, having listened to the officer speaking and what he had to say, I thought there was a logic to it. And I think maybe some members have been a bit emotive in not wanting to discharge the one or But, you know, I will support the officer. I think what you said, I think listen to what you said. It, it was, that's where the logic is. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Carr. Uh, I'll bring in a legal officer, um, Lisa Jones. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to come in. Obviously, um, when we enter into Section 106 planning obligations, they obviously have to comply with statutory tests. Um, Chair, ask Lisa to put the microphone closer to us. Can you hear me Thank now? You. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, when, we, when the council enters into Section 106 agreements, it obviously has to comply with certain statutory tests. Um, it has to be reasonable to request the financial obligation, it has to be necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms, directly related to the development and fairly and reasonably related in scale and kind. Obviously, as part of that assessment, the officers um, will be assessing the viability assessments that ordinarily come in with the planning applications. I think just to bear in mind in this instance is if this were to, to be um, a new planning application in front of you now or have this information been in front of you at the time, um, it would have been assessed as unviable for these particular financial contributions. So I appreciate that information wasn't there and Section 106 agreements in place now and it says what it says. Um, However, just for members to be mindful, really, and to be aware that it may become an issue to enforce that planning obligation should the council need to later on, um, in you know, in light of the evidence in front of us, um, whether that's you know, the council needs to enforce it because there's been a non-payment if the development commences, um, and I think obviously it would be a consideration as well if if the applicant did appeal. Um, four years down the line, um, the planning inspector would obviously take into account this information um, and, and could very well decide, well, this is unviable, so the 106 obligation um, should be discharged or modified accordingly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Lisa. Councillor Stephen Price from Chamber. Um, you mentioned the fact that it... Um, 
they can discharge the 106 after five years. I'm just wondering why has it taken five years to get to this stage? Was this, was this a deliberate ploy by the developer or is it just a, a process that took five years? Okay, bring in Mr. Thomas. Five years is the period that's specified in the legislation. There's effectively um, two mechanisms whereby a Section 106 agreement can be varied or discharged. So one procedure is the informal procedure. It can, it can, it can be done at any time, but that has to be done by, by agreement between the local authority and any other party who has an interest that's bound by the agreement. The second mechanism is that the Act prescribes a period after five years where an applicant can make an application under Section 106A, which effectively the local authority is required to consider. So it, 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 it's, it's not a purely voluntary arrangement. It's, re, it's required to come to a decision as to whether or not to discharge the 106. Um, and in the case of if a Section 106, Section 106 obligation is refused, then in those circumstances, it, it would go to an appeal. Okay. I don't know if that answers the question. Or did you have another one? Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, Andrew Wood, you got your hand up, Councillor Andrew Wood? Yes, I've chaired. Just a very quick one. This will, if you're not careful, which will send a precedence. Every construction cost will become unviable. You'll lose all your Section 106 money. And uh, I, for one, as a planning committee member, do, want, do not want to sanction this. Um, you know, if it's a commercial thing, as I said before, if they can't make it viable, they'll have to look at something else, bring it back to planning or sell that site on. So I would just like to endorse what Joe said before. Thank you. But let's not set a precedence. Okay, thanks, Councillor Wood. Uh, Councillor David Carr, were you making a proposal that we accepted the officer's recommendation or were you just supporting what they said? I can't hear Councillor Carr at all. It's so, nothing at all. coming back in, Councillor Wood. Right, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat that again. I just thought what Kerry made was a very logical argument, but, but I think the sense of the meeting is uh, to vote not to discharge it, so I won't be putting a proposal forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Carr. Just wanted to clear that up. Um, one of the advantages, or disadvantages maybe, of being a chair and the, the vice chair of this committee is we have um, a pre-meet. Um, yesterday afternoon and myself and uh, Councillor Austin raised similar concerns to uh, what members have raised today. However, we probably had uh, the advantage perhaps of um, really detailed explanations of the possibilities. Um, if we don't discharge, um, so yeah, I think members have heard pretty much what we heard yesterday. Um, Councillor Austin and I both raised similar concerns. Uh, however, uh, I can't see where the officers are coming from on this. And uh, I'll wait till we go to the vote. Okay. Yeah, no. Councillor um, Austin Roberts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's I agree with what the chair has said. And I also understand Councillor Hunter and myself yesterday raised the point no. right okay um I'll, I'll say this in english then um no i um i can reiterate exactly what councillor allen has just said um both of us did raise um what the majority has raised today concerns about this it, it doesn't make sense really and i agree with what councillor wood has said however um, we've had the advantage of being in the pre-meet, we've had the advantage of information in front of us, and we have the advantage of knowing what the consequences could be. Um, and that's all I can say, really, but it's, it's quite clear that um, as both Councillor Hunter and myself foresaw, that um, the vast majority of this committee would be minded to go against recommendation. Okay, thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, Councillor Eva Lloyd? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I can see this plot being empty now for five years. 
you just see how it's going to play out. Um, no need for a crystal ball. Um, it's it's this one. This site's been a difficult one, and windfall sites are these small sites. We don't have very many small developers in our areas doing sections like this because of viability. So I don't really know what the answer is going to be. Um, but that's something we really need to work on the next LDP. You know, yeah. Okay, thanks, Councillor Reaver. I'll just bring in Councillor Austin uh, again before I bring in Councillor Wood, then Councillor Nigel Smith. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, I am going to play the devil's advocate and I am going to propose that we go with officer's recommendation. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Austin. Uh, Councillor Andrew Wood. I just a very quick one, Chair. I presume, Chair, and Austin at your pre meet that obviously there's things you've discussed, but what Kerry have outlined to us today. So I don't understand how maybe you two have a, a distinct, different um, pre meet sort of um, answer or idea of what, what the advice was. I was quite clear about what Kerry said, I'm quite clear about what would happen. Um, but this is a commercial. Uh, this is a commercial um, decision um, by the agent and the applicant, and we should not be supporting that by removing what is two, just over 2% of the total bill budget. So, no, I can't see why you would actually want to do that. And you will be setting a precedence. I can see it over in the floodgates already. You know, the rest of it will just rub their hands. So be very careful what you wish for. Hey, Councillor Wood, that is probably a two-way street. Careful what you wish for, because as Councillor Ebo has alluded to, this site could remain empty for five years. So it's uh, that's the sort of things we were considering yesterday. And yes, you have pretty much heard everything that we heard. Maybe had a bit more time to uh, absorb. Um, but I say we'll go to the vote. Uh, Councillor Nigel Smith and Councillor Ebo Lloyd wants to come back in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, just uh, you know, so we know what the full consequences are here. If the developer doesn't bring this site forward for development, leaves it empty for five years, that isn't cost free. It will cost him. It'll cost additional money. If he decides not to bring the application forward as has already been approved by us, he will have to put a new set of plans in, pay an architect. That all costs money as well. And, you know, I think Andrew put it into percentage, being a businessman, was it 2.6% or 10,500 pounds per apartment? It, it's small fry, and I think the additional cost for not bringing this development forward, as as we've already approved, uh, would would outweigh the fifty two thousand pounds. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor Nigel. Um, I think a lot of the comments that have been made are repeating now. So I'll bring in Councillor Evo Lloyd and then Councillor Stephen Price in the chamber. Yeah. Okay. Um, Two percent of nothing is nothing. Yeah. There's, there's a taste on something, there's no taste on nothing. You know, there's money in something, there's no money in nothing. If that site isn't developed in a five-year period, that's builders, local builders that are not building. That's local families that are not getting fed. So it depends how you look at this. Yeah? If we're not building, then we're not providing houses. We're not providing houses, we're not providing jobs, we're not providing families with food. So... The way I look at this is more pragmatically in Welsh, yeah, more outward looking in. So there's other costs. So it'll be so, something like this here. Sorry? So, yeah. So I'd second, um, I think. Wayne, do you want to go and have a look at this gentleman's? Nigel, do you want to turn your microphone off, please? You're coming through in the chamber. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to second uh, Councillor uh, Austin's proposal. Let's go with the recommendation. We do have uh, departures to policy, but this policy is so woolly, I think we need to work on it in the next LDP. But this one, I don't think I could pass that site and think, well, we shouldn't have developed that. I think we need to develop that because we've got such a shortfall of houses in the county. So, like I say, I'm looking at the bigger picture, but we need to work on this situation and we need to ask the question, why developers, the big developers, don't want to build in Conway? So we need to look at viability as a whole. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, thanks, Councillor Eva Lloyd. Uh, in the chamber, we have Councillor Stephen Price, then we've got Councillor Joe Nussel, then Councillor Tristan Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Andrew Wood alluded to this um, on his previous comments. Um, I just want for clarification, um, the meeting that you had yesterday, um, is there potential that this could be misinterpreted as predetermination? I just want some clarification from the officers. I'll bring Lisa in. Just, just to confirm, members, uh, the meeting that took place yesterday was a, a chairman's a chairman's briefing. Um, obviously, we have those um, prior to every committee. Um, the matters that were discussed were the matters on the agenda, including this item. Um, obviously, the members, the the chair and the vice chair were present. Um, and I, I can assure you that there was nothing discussed there that hasn't been discussed today before the members. Um, planning officer provided advice which is contained in, within the report uh, similarly the advice I provided today um, was similar to the advice I provided yesterday so there's, there's nothing um, I'm not concerned about any predetermination was the meeting minuted is... uh, no the pre-meets for scrutiny or planning committee licensing committee are not minuted I can assure members that in every pre-meet that I've taken part in, I make no predetermination on any application. I've sat here today listening to the debate. Um, at this point, um, I'm still waiting to make a decision on which way I will vote. But I can assure members I have never, ever predetermined anything. The idea of a pre-meet is so that the chairman, vice chairman, is aware of any legal implications that we may have to raise or that we should be aware of coming into this meeting to allow us to chair the meeting in a more professional manner. Uh, can I could just come in? I'll bring Councillor Austin in. Yeah, um, I am the same. I have never made any predetermination. However, both Councillor Allen and myself have been on this planning committee. I've been on it for seven years and I think so have you, Alan? Six, yeah. and. Um, all I can say is that with experience, you um, you take in the information that is given to you, and then you assess the situation, and then you come to a decision. In the past, it's been pointed out that members sometimes go against recommendation, and that is their right, and that is one of the purposes of this committee is to look again at decisions made by officers and to give a different perspective. Um, so that's what happens in these committees. And sometimes uh, we all decide to go against. Sometimes we all decide to, uh, to, to back officers' recommendations. And sometimes there is a difference of opinion for different reasons. And that's what's happening here. Um, there's a well saying, uh, roughly translated, everybody has the right to his opinion and everybody has the right to be heard and everybody has the right to be different. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, Councillor Joan Nuttall. Just want to say that I stick by everything that I said before. Um, nothing that I've heard changes my mind, um, and I'd like this to to go to the vote. Yeah, we'll go to the vote shortly, Joe. But we do have another speaker, and I think I'll make this the last one because we have heard everything. I think, and the comments will just continue around. But we have uh, Councillor Tristan Lewis in the chamber. Mr. Katera, do you have Chair, can I speak in Welsh? Can you hear me? Translation working. Is the translation working? Two words, I've listened carefully and I hear all the points on both sides. And certainly, as Councillor Ivo says, there's room to look at this in more detail in terms of policy. But two words I'd like to use. Uh, the first is principle and the second is precedent. And we've heard uh, Joe Nuttall and so on and Councillor Wood say that there is a pr matter of principle here. And I think we need to look uh, look at that and uh, have principles. But the second thing is that it sets the danger of a precedent. 
and that's why I will support Councillor Joe. Thank you, Chair. The Oc, Councillor Tristan Lewis. Okay, um, I think we are ready to go to the vote. So we take the first one, the one from Councillor Joe first. Yes, you've got two proposals. Yeah. One, two. Can we hear it, please? Okay, hey, members, so there's two proposals. One is um, to refuse um, refuse the application to discharge the Section 106 proposed by Councillor Nettle and seconded by Councillor Mandy Hawkins. And another proposal to go with the officer's recommendation proposal uh, proposal as Councillor Austin, seconded by Councillor Ivar Lloyd. Um, Chair, you need to take the um, refusal proposal first because that's contrary to the recommendation. Okay, so that's Councillor Joe's proposal that we uh, refuse the uh, discharge, which is against the officer's recommendations. So can we have a show of hands, please? Okay, we have nine in favour, against. Is Councillor Trevor voting on both? No, Councillor Trevor, your hand's still up on the against. I think you voted previously for... Okay, smash, that's great. Thank, thanks, Councillor Trevor. Okay, that's three against, so that uh, proposal is carried. And this will, again, come back to us next month uh, as it is against the officer's recommendations. So thanks, everybody. Again, uh, a very good meeting, some lively debate, and uh, I'll see you all next month. Thanks Thank very you, much. Thank you, Chair. Well done. The Octrap.